الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد uh, this evening, uh, we are in the third of the, these four lectures that are being delivered here at this university. And the title of uh, this lecture, which I have been asked to deliver, is regarding the revivers of the faith. It is regarding the scholars of Islam. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised knowledge and has praised scholarship in his scripture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Equal are they, those who know and those who do not know? And this is a rhetorical question that Allah is asking. Those who have knowledge, are they equivalent to those who do not have knowledge? Are they equal? The answer, of course, is no. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ دَرَجَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise those who believe amongst you and those who were given knowledge, degrees. Not a single degree, but many degrees. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that those who have been given knowledge will be raised by him. Many degrees over those who do not have knowledge. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us that those who truly fear him are those who have knowledge. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ That those who fear Allah among his servants are the scholars. And so those who have knowledge, because they have knowledge of Allah azawajal, they know how to fear Allah. They know who Allah is, and then they know how to fear him. Because if you're ignorant of Allah azawajal, if you don't know Allah's names and attributes, if you're ignorant of the realities of the Day of Judgment, if you're ignorant of what Allah requires of you from duties, then how could you fear Allah Azawajal? If you don't know that your Lord is severe in punishment, if you don't know the different forms and types of punishment that He has meted out to the previous nations and individuals who have disobeyed him or those forms of punishment to which he will met out to those who disobey him and disbelieve in him in the hereafter if you do not know what is required of you so therefore you would feel guilty if you have not fulfilled that then how can you fear Allah? How can you fear Allah in that case? Obviously you can't. And so that's why this ayah in the Quran, Allah says that those who fear him from his servants are the scholars. 
And likewise, we find in the Sunnah, the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, many statements praising scholars and praising knowledge and praising the attaining and the seeking of knowledge. For example, we find in the Hadith of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, radiyallahu anhuma, as reported by Bukhari and Muslim. That the Prophet ﷺ says, Whomever Allah intends well for, He gives him comprehension in the religion, understanding in the religion. So this is a sign that a person may use to see if Allah wants good for him. That, does he have knowledge in the religion of Islam? Now yes, a person could have knowledge, and then not act upon that knowledge, and so therefore that might be a cause of torment for him in the hereafter. But without doubt, a person who has no knowledge, it could be a sign that Allah does not wish well for him. And so therefore that person needs to repent and start seeking knowledge so that Allah can wish well for him. That perhaps he may become comprehending and knowledgeable in his religion. And indeed, in another hadith, uh, the hadith of Abu Umama, the Prophet's companion Abu Umama, uh, that it was mentioned before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a worshipper and a scholar. Before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it was mentioned a worshipper. I mean, a person who engages in righteous acts, but is not knowledgeable. A person who sticks to the mosque, prays, fasts, gives charity, but is not knowledgeable. And a scholar. And the Prophet ﷺ replied that the merit of the scholar above the worshipper is like the merit of me, of the Prophet ﷺ, over the least of you. We know from another hadith, even though the hadith has some weakness in it, but the meaning is sound. We know from another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that he was placed in one pan of the balance and the rest of the ummah, every single member of this ummah, from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to the last people of this ummah were placed in the other pan. And the Prophet ﷺ outweighed them all. So here the Prophet ﷺ is saying, that the difference between him and the least of us is like the difference between the scholar and the worshiper. And likewise we find uh, in a hadith, uh, in, in the same very hadith, uh, we find that the Prophet ﷺ then continues to say that indeed Allah and the angels and the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth, even the ant in its hole, and the fish in the sea, pray and, and ask Allah to bless the person who teaches people good things. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ has said, Again, describing the difference between the scholar and the worshiper. That the merit of the scholar above the worshiper is like the difference between the light of the moon when it's full and the rest of the stars. If ever any of you have looked at the night when the moon is full, and especially from what I've, I've heard that here in the southern hemisphere, you see a lot more stars than we do who live in the northern hemisphere of the globe. And yet, even with that, the fact that you see more stars, the difference between the brilliance of the moon when the, night is, when the moon is full in a clear night, as opposed to the brilliance of any of the stars, is quite prominent. And like such is the difference between the scholar and the worshiper. This is the similitude the Prophet ﷺ is giving us. And then the Prophet ﷺ said that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. And that the prophets did not leave as inheritance 
either dinar or dirham. This is the currency of the Arabs, dinar and dirham, or as we might say, dollars and cents. But rather the prophets left as inheritance knowledge. So whoever takes from this knowledge has received a very good portion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us, as reported by Imam Ahmed in his Musnid, that indeed the angels lower their wings for the purpose, for the person who is seeking knowledge out of pleasure for what he is seeking. So one would hope that when we come to a gathering like this seeking to learn or any other gathering, that as we pass through the roads and the streets, that the angels lower their wings out of pleasure for what we are seeking. And indeed, as Imam Muslim reports upon Abu Huraira, that the Prophet ﷺ has said, he who seeks a path, or he who travels a path in which he seeks knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ease for him a path to paradise. So here, seeking knowledge, striving to learn Allah's religion, as a result, one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eases for you a path to paradise. Now, these are just very few of the verses of the Qur'an, the ayat, and the statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his ahadith, praising scholars and scholarship and knowledge and the seekers of knowledge. Tonight's lecture, though, what I would like to focus on primarily is the place of the scholars. What should the place of the scholars be in our hearts, and how should we deal with our scholars? For many Muslims are ignorant of this. And as a result, they often speak ill about the scholars. And this is something quite dangerous indeed. Indeed, we know that it is part of the good character of a Muslim that he shows good character to his fellow Muslim. Not only that, that he shows good character to all of humanity. Not only that, that he shows good character even to the animals and the plants. And if this is the case, then how much more so should his character be to the best of humanity? And so therefore, we would like to start by showing, as we have in these ayat, that the scholars have upon us certain rights. Certain rights which require of us to deal with them in a specific way. Among these rights is that they are fellow Muslims. And so therefore we must observe in them the rights of Allah. Among these rights is that typically scholarship is only obtained after a person has reached elderly age. And so therefore they have the rights of being our elders. Among the rights that they have over us is that Scholars are also those who bear the Qur'an in their memorization of it, and in their recitation of it, and in their teaching of it. And so therefore, we are told to respect the Qur'an and honor it because it is Allah's literal words sent to humanity. And those who bear it must also take a portion of that respect. Among the rights of the scholars is that the scholars are always righteous people who deeds coincide and are in agreement with their statements. And so therefore, we must respect them for their righteousness and their piety and their fearfulness and their humbleness before Allah. And also, those scholars have rights upon us because of their knowledge, because they are the inheritors of what the prophets leave. And so therefore, part of our respect to the prophets of Allah, part of our respect to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
is to respect those who carry that which he has left and spread it amongst the people. And that is why to speak ill about the scholars is a very severe sin in Islam. Speaking ill is a severe sin. But speaking ill about the scholars is only more severe. For one of the rights that Muslims have and share upon each other is that what we call in Arabic, what the Sharia refers to as al-ird, must be preserved. Indeed, this is one of the aims of Allah's law, the Sharia. For as many of you might know, if we look at the Sharia, if we look at Allah's laws, in terms of the acts of worship, in terms of the mutual transactions that human beings share, from marriage and divorce and buying and selling and so forth, in terms of society and how the society is to be organized, in terms of belief, in terms of conduct and etiquette and behaviors and manners, all of this can be summarized in the sense that the Sharia tries to preserve five or six major principles. Religion, uh, blood, sanity, lineage, wealth, and also al-ird. And al-ird is a word which is difficult to translate into English. In fact, some people have argued that it has no equivalent in the English language. And it means that part of a person which is praised or condemned. In other words, you might say, the closest word to it, his reputation. How people look to him or her. So part of the aim of the Sharia is that a Muslim's repute is preserved, is not sullied, is not attacked. We understand how even amongst the unbelievers, they realize the importance of keeping people's repute unsullied. And that's why you find in laws in like countries like Australia or the United States, there are laws of libel. In other words, when you falsely accuse somebody of something, like in the paper article or in television, something public, he can take you to the court and the court can punish you for lying against him. Even the unbelievers recognize the importance of this. But the Prophet ﷺ has raised this issue to its true position, to the highest position required. Notice this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, in his final pilgrimage, in his farewell pilgrimage, in his final khutbah, in front of a hundred thousand plus of his companions, the Prophet ﷺ leaves us with these final words, among which is, Indeed, your blood and your wealth and your arad, which is a plural of the word, arad, your reputes, are forbidden for you to transgress upon, like the invoyability of this day. This is in Hajj, the day of Arafah. Like the invoyability of this month, the month of Dhul Hijjah. Like the invoyability of this city, the city of Mecca. So, a Muslim's blood, that it should not be shed, a Muslim's wealth, that it should not be taken, and a Muslim's repute, that it should not be attacked, are equivalent. Just like now, we would find it something horrible to hear that a Muslim transgressed upon another Muslim and took his wealth, let alone shed his blood. Likewise, we must feel that if someone transgresses upon the repute of another Muslim, it is equally horrible. And the sacredness, the invoyability of the wealth and the blood and the repute of a Muslim is like the invoyability of the day of Arafah, of the month of Dhul Hijjah, of Mecca itself. Indeed, Abu Huraira has told us that the Prophet ﷺ has said, that every Muslim has a right upon the other Muslim that his blood and his wealth and his repute, it is forbidden for the other Muslim to transgress upon it. This is one of your rights as a Muslim. And this is something that you would 
expect from your fellow Muslim. That he wouldn't shed your blood, that he wouldn't take your money, and also that he wouldn't attack your repute. And indeed, in the hadith of Jabir reported by Imam Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ described the Muslim is the one who saves the other Muslims from his tongue and his hand by attacking them or harming them. Indeed, Abdullah ibn Umar, the Prophet's companion, one day glances to the Kaaba and says, How great you are! How great is your invoyability before Allah! Your sacredness! But the believer is more sacred and his, and his repute and his blood is more invoyable than you. So here Ibn Umar is describing, saying that the believer's blood and wealth and repute has an invoyability higher and greater than the Kaaba itself. What would we now do if we heard that somebody tried to attack the Kaaba? Tried to do something to the Kaaba? I think the people would just be so angered that they would just become masses and and would want to rip that person apart. So the, the Muslim, his blood and his wealth and his repute is of a higher status than the Kaaba. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade the Prophet ﷺ from taking Mecca by force from the unbelievers because there were some believers there who were hiding their Islam. And that, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that perhaps you might trample over them without realizing that they're Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for his house, for his place which he has established for the worship, for his worship, to remain sullied with idols and to be used by the pagans in order to preserve the blood of those Muslims who were hiding in Mecca and could not publicly announce their Islam. And we find also another idea to show us how the earliest Muslims understood this. That one time, Sufyan bin Hassan says, I was sitting with Iyas bin Muawiyah. Iyas bin Muawiyah was one of the great judges of the second generation of Muslims, those we call the Tabi'een. And so Sufyan bin Hassan says, I was sitting with this judge, Iyas bin Muawiyah, and with him was another man. And I was afraid that other man would say something bad about me if I was to leave. So I decided to sit and wait for that other man to go. And when that other man went, I began to talk about him. I began to speak ill about him. And so Iyas, the judge, was silent until I had finished to say what I had to say. Just looking at me, not saying anything. And then he asked me, have you waged jihad against the Dalem? The Dalem are a mountainous people who live in Persia. Now, I mean, now they're Muslims, but at that time they were non-Muslim people. And Sufyan bin Hassan says no. Then uh, Iyas asks him, then perhaps you have waged jihad against the people of Sindh, which is an area in Pakistan. At that time those people were non-Muslims, but of course, alhamdulillah, now they're Muslims. And Sufyan bin Hassan also says no. So Iyas says, then perhaps against India you have waged jihad. And Sufyan bin Hassan also says no. So then Iyas says, and perhaps against Europe, the Romans, the Christians, you have waged jihad. And Sufyan bin Hassan says no. So then Iyas says, so the Dalam and the people of Sindh and the people of India and the Europeans have been saved from you attacking them, and yet your brother Muslim is the uh, target of your attack? So Sufyan bin Hassan says, I never went back to doing that again. Again, this is another example showing us about the importance of the repute of a Muslim. Indeed, better than that is this hadith of Sahal bin Sa'ad, who says, radiallahu anhu, says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever can guarantee for me that which lies between his jaws and that which lies between his legs, I will guarantee for him paradise. Whoever can guarantee for me that which lies between his jaws, meaning his tongue or her tongue, or can guarantee for me that which lies between his legs, meaning his or her private parts, 
I will guarantee for them paradise. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden in Surah Al-Hujurat that we backbite one another and has rendered backbiting equivalent to eating the flesh of one's dead brother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, would any of you eat the flesh of one's deceased brother? Fakarehtumu, you would hate to do that. Meaning that backbiting is like that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What taqullah? Fear Allah then. In other words, don't backbite. And if you've done backbiting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reassures us by saying, Inna Allah tawabun rahim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the repentance and he forgives. He's merciful. So one can now turn to repentance for what has passed from him. So what is backbiting? How do we understand it? One day, as Abu Huraira reports to us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks his companions, do you know what al-ghiba is? Which we might translate as backbiting. The companions say, Allah and his messenger know best. This also shows us something of the manners of the Prophet's companions, radiallahu anhu in that they were not quick to offer their own answers and speculate. You see now, unfortunately, most Muslims, he has his version of Islam ready right here in his pocket. Just pull it out, huh? And he'll be willing to give you his interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah. Let's say how the Sahaba were the best of humanity. The Prophet Sallallahu says, do you know what, what is al-ghiba, what is backbiting? Of course they know what the word means. But they say, no, Allah and his messenger know. Because obviously the Prophet ﷺ, by asking this question, he's trying to point to a very important meaning. And they don't want to be quick to answer, they want the Prophet ﷺ to teach them. And so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, says, it is to mention your fellow brother Muslim, to mention something about it which he like, dislikes for you to mention about him. One of the Prophet's companions asks a question. What do you think if what I say about him is true? The Prophet ﷺ has then says, if what you said about him is true, you've backbited him. And if what you have said about him is not true, you've slandered him. So to mention anything about your fellow Muslim, which your fellow Muslim does not want to be said about him, something which, which disturbs him, is backbiting. Even if it's true about him. And if it's a lie against him, you have now slandered him. You've even committed a greater sin. And that's why Imam al-Qurtubi has said there is no difference between the scholars. That backbiting is among the major sins. And that whoever backbites any other Muslim, it is upon him to turn into repentance unto Allah. So if we understand the great danger of backbiting, we can now understand this very wise statement said by one of the earlier scholars of the Muslims, Ibn Hibban. He says it is the responsibility, the obligation upon everybody who is clear thinking, somebody who is reasonable, that he stays on the safe side by leaving, trying to find the faults in people. But rather he should work or he, she, he or she should work in fixing his own or her own faults. Indeed, one of the earliest Muslims, uh, Al-Rabi' bin Khuthaym, was one time asked by his companions. His companions, those who sit with him, said, we have never seen you backbite anybody. So Al-Rabi' said, I am not pleased with myself in order for me to spend my time now following people and criticizing them. See how the earlier Muslims were? They were not pleased with their own selves, even though these were the great scholars the, from the second generation, Rabi' ibn Khuthaym, those who are the best of humanity after the Prophet ﷺ's generation, and yet he's saying, I'm not pleased with myself for me to be now chasing after people and following their faults. And Muhammad bin Sirin used to say, he was also from the great scholars of the second generation, so we were used to be taught, meaning by the Prophet's companions, that the people who have the greatest sins are those who spend 
their time talking about the sins and mistakes of others. And Al-Fudayl bin Iyad, one of also the great scholars, pious people of the earliest generation of Muslims used to say, whoever seeks leadership, you will find in him that he is jealous, envious, that he transgresses, and that he follows up the faults of people. And he hates that anybody is mentioned before him in good. You know, often when, um, often when you visit different Muslim cities or different Muslim areas, unfortunately you, you find that Muslim organizations, Muslim communities are often in dispute with each other. And when you investigate as to the causes of their dispute, sometimes it is because that one group is upon the truth in one matter and the other group is upon falsehood. That is sometimes true. But in the majority of the time you find that the causes of their dispute is that each seeks to be in charge. And so therefore what Al-Fudayr bin Iyav is warning about, you find it amongst these people. That they become envious, that they transgress upon each other, that they follow the faults, follow up the faults of people, and they don't want anybody else besides them to be said something good about them. Now, we find also Malik bin Dinar, another great scholar from the second generation, he used to say, suffice it for an individual, suffice it in evil for an individual, that he or she himself is not a righteous person and yet speaks ill about the righteous people. Suffice it evil for a person, be he male or female, who themselves are not righteous but yet find fault and speak evil about the righteous people. And then Bakr bin Abdullah, another great scholar from the earliest generation says, if you find a person <clears throat> talking about the faults of the people, forgetting about his own faults, then know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is plotting against this person, seeking to send this person into destruction. Whenever you see a person who's just talking about this person and that person and this group and that group, and forgetting about his own faults, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending this person into destruction. Now, if after hearing these ayat and these hadith about the dangers of backbiting and hearing the statements of the earliest Muslims regarding this, so obviously the responsibility is we have to hold back our tongues. And suffice it if we were just taken this one ayah from the Quran and contemplated it, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, in uh, Surah Qaf, مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ That a human being does not pronounce or say anything except there is one watching ready to write that down, meaning the angels. Mujahid, one of the great scholars of the second generation, says that everything you say is written, even the groaning sounds you make when you're ill. Anybody who would think of this would then know to hold his tongue back. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, as mentioned in the hadith of Abdullah bin Amr in the Tirmidhi, says, he who is silent will be saved. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, as we find in the hadith in Bukhari and in Muslim, as Abu Huraira relates to us, the Prophet ﷺ said that he who believes in Allah and the last day, then let him say good or let him be silent. And the Prophet ﷺ was described, they used to describe the Prophet ﷺ, the companions, you know, when they were asked by the second generation of Muslims, how, because the second generation of Muslims didn't see the Prophet ﷺ. So they used to ask the companions, how was the Prophet ﷺ's physical appearance? How was his character? How was his worship? How did he deal with people? So they used to describe the Prophet ﷺ that he was often, you know, for long periods of time silent. And he would laugh very little. Because as the Prophet ﷺ says, too much laughter kills the heart. And indeed the Prophet ﷺ forewarned us that sometimes we might say something and not pay attention to its, to its, to its, uh, its great danger. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us, as reported by Abu Huraira in the Hadith of Tirmidhi, 
that a person might say a word to which he does not consider to be much. But by saying this, this will cause him to fall in the hellfire for 70 years. Imagine a single statement you might say, you might not consider it to be a big deal, but it will be cause for you to fall in the hellfire for 70 years. And the, 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 the notion of falling in the hellfire for 70 years means how deep you're going to be in the hellfire. Because the hellfire is degrees. The shallower parts of the hellfire is of less punishment. The deeper parts of the hellfire is more severe punishment. So if you're following, following for 70 years, it means you're getting to the depths of the hellfire. Just because of something that you might have said, and not considered it to be a big deal. And so therefore, a Muslim must strive and struggle to overcome speaking ill about people and preserving his tongue. Indeed, this is what jihad means, the essence of jihad. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that al-mujahid, the mujahid is he who strives, struggles against himself for Allah In other words, he struggles to overcome his own evils for the sake of Allah And in the hadith of Abu Dhar, the Prophet ﷺ says, the best of jihad, the best of jihad is that you struggle with your own soul and with your own desires for the sake of Allah. Now, somebody might say, well, okay, I understand this now, and I will not ever again participate in backbiting any Muslim, speaking ill about any Muslim. Is that sufficient? Indeed, not only the person who speaks ill about a Muslim, but the one who listens to the person speaking ill about a Muslim, they are equivalent in sin. Um, and, 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 the, and, and the evidence to this is the hadith regarding al-Aslami, reported by Abu Dawood. Al-Aslami was a person who committed zina. A person who committed zina. And he came to the Prophet wasallam and said, I have committed this sin. So the Prophet wasallam turned away from him, and then he repeated it. And the Prophet wasallam kept on trying to turn away from him until he repeated it four times. So then the Prophet Sallallahu commanded that this man be taken and stoned. So the man was stoned. And so then therefore two people, one said to the other, said, wouldn't this man have been better for this man to have remained silent and covered his own sin up by not exposing himself before the Prophet and then, become, and then being stoned like a dog is stoned? So the Prophet Sallallahu didn't say anything. It then happened that the Prophet ﷺ was walking and he came across a carcass of a donkey, a decaying carcass of a donkey. So he asked, where were those two men who one said to the other such and such? So they came forth and said to us, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, eat from this decaying carcass. The men said, O Messenger of Allah, and who would do that? The Prophet ﷺ said, by you speaking about your brother, it is worse than to eat from this decaying carcass. He is now in the rivers of paradise being cleansed from his sins. So here in this incident, one person talked, but the other listened and didn't attack, didn't defend, didn't reject what was being said. He acknowledged it, and so therefore he accepted it. And so therefore, the one who speaks ill and the one who listens to that are equivalent in sin. And that's why it is upon the believer that when ill is spoken about a Muslim before him, he should stop that being said. For in the hadith reported by the Prophet's companion, the Prophet's female companion, Asma bint Yazid, she says that the Prophet ﷺ said that he who protects the arud, the repute of his fellow Muslim brother, behind his brother's back, it is his right upon Allah that Allah will free him from the hellfire. So when somebody speaks ill about your fellow Muslim, and that brother or sister is not in their presence, and then you go and defend them, now you have a right. There's a right upon Allah that Allah will free you from the hellfire. And so therefore, if we understand all this, we must realize then, 
If this is with the average Muslim, then how much more so is this true now with the scholars who have all those rights which I alluded to earlier in the sense that they are the inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ. They are typically the elderly, so they have the rights of being older. They are typically the righteous, so therefore they have the rights of righteousness, of the righteous people. They are those who carry the Qur'an, so they have the rights of the Qur'an. They are those who are the revivers of this religion, and so therefore they have the rights of this religion. All these rights. How much more so is the sin greater when we speak ill about the scholars? And therefore, that is why, if you look in the books, the Islamic books, you find that even the scholars, when they wrote their books, they even used to talk about the etiquette of a person who seeks knowledge. That even the student has to have certain etiquette before his teacher. You know, unlike now, for instance, you know, I mean, all of us have been educated here in the West. I mean, and I imagine here in Australia it's not much different than what we have in the United States, right? You can sit there before your professor, right? And chew gum, for instance, you know? You can sit there and say, you know, hey, how, how's it going, Jack, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, Bob or Fred or whatever his name is, you know? No, no necessarily, you know, any respect that he's a professor or a teacher. I mean, because they, these people, they don't have this type of respect. I mean, they don't have respect to their parents, so how would you expect them to show respect in their society to the elders or then therefore to their teachers and so forth? But in Islam, no. And that's why, for instance, that, you know, some of the adab, some of the etiquette of the student of knowledge is that he should be humbled before his shaykh. He should respect his shaykh. That even when asking a question, they even say that there's certain etiquette he must have when he asks a question. Like when asking the question, he should be gentle in asking the question. Not like, hey, what do you think about? But to do it very gently. Uh, that he should consider the time, you know, not to waste the time of his teacher by asking a lot of incessant questions or questions that have no real bearing or questions of, not, of things that have not occurred just to ask questions just for the sake of being asked questions. Or asking a question just the sake, just to show he's got knowledge. So you ask a question just to show that you understand something, so you put in the form of the question. Or for instance, um, you know, when asking the scholar for his evidence, you ask it in a rude manner. Yes, you can ask him, well, what's the evidence for this? But it has to be done in a respectful manner. Or for instance, uh, being happy if you find that your, the teacher or the scholar has erred, he's forgotten something, he makes a mistake. These are all you know, some of the etiquette of asking questions. And, you know, and part of the etiquette of learning is that also when the people who are learning have to show respect, uh, respect uh, for others. I mean, it reached me that uh, some people were hurt last night when, when, when questions were asked and, and other people, you know, the, the questions were asked honestly and they were very important questions, but some people laughed at those questions. No, we shouldn't laugh at those questions. The people who are asking these questions are asking the questions because they want to know. And even though we might feel that it's a question of very you know, simple or basic question. There are some amongst us who are new Muslims. There are some amongst us who are non-Muslims who are seeking the truth. So every question has its value. So just like we have to have etiquette to, uh, to the teachers, to the sheikh, to the speaker, we also have to have etiquette toward the fellow people who are sitting with us. Now, this all shows us that it's very dangerous to attack the scholars. Indeed, the, the people of the Sunnah used to write in their books of creed used to pen the importance of, uh, of, of the scholars, the important status they used to have. For instance, Imam al-Tahawi in his very famous creed, he says, and the scholars among those who have preceded us from the Salaf, and those who follow them, those scholars who are known for their goodness and for the following of their hadith and their knowledge, they should only be mentioned in that which is good. And whoever mentions them in an evil manner, then know he's not upon the straight path. Indeed, Imam Ahmed has said it is from the major sins to speak ill about a scholar. And speaking ill about the scholars has very many great evil effects. Among the evil effects is that by speaking ill about the scholars, you're cutting off people from benefiting from their knowledge. Because once somebody is spoken ill about, people will no longer want to trust him. So when people start speaking ill about the scholars and, and, and make stories about them or rumors about them 
or, or, or try to find fault with them, then other people who come, they say, well, maybe I shouldn't benefit from this person. Maybe I should not learn from this person. Maybe I shouldn't read this person's book or hear his tape or go to his lecture or visit him because such and such has been said about him. So that's one evil. Another evil that occurs is that in actuality, by speaking ill about the scholars, you are blaming, you are finding ill in Allah's religion, the Sharia. Why? Because the scholars are the ones who carry this. They're the ones who are bearing this. They're the ones who are transmitting this. So if those who transmit it are evil, then obviously the source of what they transmit might itself be evil. And that's why the sin, those sects which attack the Prophet's companions, they're considered to be the worst of the Muslims. Because if the companions of the Prophet ﷺ are as they described, evil men and women, then the one who teach, taught them is what? Obviously, he is either was unaware of that, so how could he be a prophet of Allah Azawajal, or he himself was evil. And so therefore, if you attack the scholars, and they're the ones who are carrying and transmitting Allah's religion, then therefore, in a way, you are actually attacking Allah's religion. Because if those who are the best of the ummah, who are carrying the religion of Allah, are evil, then, then what is left? Likewise, that part of the evils that occur when people attack the scholars is that you, it causes some of the good people Uh, it causes uh, the people of good sometimes then not to go out and spread their knowledge. Because they think the people around them are all evil people just attacking and finding fault in them. And they say, well, why should I you know, open myself to be attacked in my repute? So, therefore, they decide to hold back and, and stay and avoid public contact. So this is an evil. You're, you're cutting them off from people benefiting, being benefited by them. Among the evils is that when you attack the scholars and find fault in them, then you find ignorant people filling the vacuum. People who are ignorant and who uh, do not uh, deserve to be in positions of leadership and teaching and so forth. Contemplate uh, this hadith. Contemplate this hadith. Um, the Prophet ﷺ has said that Islam would become apparent. In other words, you know, Islam, when the Prophet ﷺ first started to preach, it was something strange. Only a few people entered Islam, but the Prophet of Islam was going to become something widespread, something apparent. So much so that the traders will travel the seas spreading Islam. And horses will go forth in the path of Allah and jihad to spread Islam. And then a people will appear who will read the Quran and they will say, We are the most, the best reciters of the Quran. We are the most knowledgeable people. We are the most understanding of people. The Prophet ﷺ then asked, are these people any good? The companion said, Allah knows best, and the Prophet ﷺ knows best. The Prophet ﷺ answered that they are from this ummah, and they are the people who are the fuel of the hellfire. Because they come out pretending to be scholars, but in reality they are not scholars. So they say, we are the most knowledgeable, we are the most uh, uh, reciters of the Qur'an, we have the most fiqh, but they're not so. And so therefore, they are the fuel of the hellfire. Now, my final point is, and I've got over time, so I apologize to the organizers and also to the audience, is who is the scholar then? Who is the scholar? Well, in short, if I was to ask you now, who is a doctor? How would you know who is a true doctor? You know that by signs around that shows that this person who is practicing medicine is really accomplished in that. And the same thing with the scholar. There are signs which indicate that he is truly a scholar, not a charlatan. One thing is, is that he is fearful of Allah Azza wa Jalla, and you find that his deeds and his conduct are in agreement with his, what he's preaching is. That's one thing. Second thing is that you find that he has taken knowledge from those who were known in the Ummah to be scholars, and those took it from those who were known and so forth until you go back to the Prophet among the signs is that you find the people of the earth, wherever this person goes, the people of the earth accept this person. They are pleased with them. I mean, I mean here by the people of the earth, the Muslim people, the righteous people. Take this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ says, as reported by Abu Huraira, 
that when Allah loves one of his servants on the earth, he calls out to Jibreel. <coughs> and Jibreel then falls prostrate and then raises his head. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Jibreel that, O oh, Jibreel, I love so and so, so love him. So then the angel Jibreel starts loving this person. And then Jibreel announces in the heavens to the other angels, Allah loves so and so, so love him. So the other angels love this person. And then on earth, acceptance is given for this person. And that's why you find the great scholars of Islam are those who the people of the earth have accepted. The Muslims have accepted, have all agreed to their scholarship. That wherever you go, you find the people listening to their fatwas, trying to follow them, asking them, looking up to them, praising them. At the time of their death, people are in tears. People in large multitudes pray upon their funeral prayers. Just like we witnessed during the last year, in the year 1420, when a number of scholars died. And I'd like to mention four of them because wherever you travel on the earth, you find these four scholars you know, that the Muslims, wherever you go in any land, you find these Muslims relying upon and benefiting from them and, and praising these men. Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Shaykh Al Albani, Abu Al Hassan Ali Al Nadwi, Sayyid Sabiq. I mean, these four men who lived in the last century, I mean, where people, wherever you go, you find people benefiting from them. Sayyid Al Sabiq, who wrote a book as a young man called Fiqh Al Sunnah, it's tra translated in over 20 or 30 languages, wherever you go. In any masjid around the world, you find a copy of that book in that language that the people speak. Abu al-Hassan Ali al-Nadwi, whose books number in the, in, maybe in the hundreds, and Muslims have been benefiting him from gen more than one generation. The great scholar of India. Also, the people of the earth have accepted him. Likewise, Shaykh al-Albari, the great scholar of Hadith, who the whole ummah has in the last century relied upon his grading and his knowledge of hadith and he's the one who has revived the sunnah in this generation and likewise Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz who his, his, his funeral prayer, his janazah was such that has never been recorded in the history of Islam such large numbers to pray upon any single individual so much so that people throughout the earth were doing salat al ghayah for this person you know I was teaching the brothers this afternoon when we were doing our course in Aqeedah about how the Prophet ﷺ taught us that if a way that if a person finds 40 righteous people prays upon his janazah, then their intercession will be accepted before Allah for that person. And how we were we were commenting how we any one of us wishes, especially since we are all living in lands of the unbelievers, that if we are afraid that if we die, where are we going to find just 40 people to pray janazah upon our, our prayer, let alone having 40 righteous people pray? Our janazah. So how about Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz who had in Mecca at least two or th million people who prayed in Masjid Haram for him. They came all over the world just to pray that. And then in city after city around the world they were praying janazah for him. Salat al ghayyab Is this not an indication of what the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu said? That if Allah loves somebody then he tells Jibreel to love him, and Jibreel loves him, and then the angels love him, and then on earth acceptance is made for him? Of course this is a sign. If this is not a sign, then what, what would be a sign? Is it not a sign that Sayyid Sabah has in every single message, in, every, in, in most homes in the world, you find people having a copy of his book, Fiqh sunnah Is this not a sign that he's been given acceptance on the earth? And what would be a sign? What would be a sign? So, anyway, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show mercy to our scholars. These were just some thoughts about the importance of you know, not backbiting our fellow Muslims and of course the scholars. And no, and finally, like Ibn uh, Nasr al-Din al Dimishqi has said, that whoever attacks the scholars, their flesh is poisonous. In other words, you know, if you backbite somebody, it's like eating the flesh of your brother. But eating the flesh of the scholar has also poison in it to you. And that whoever does this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy him in his religion before his death. So whoever you find speaking ill about the scholars, then know that before this person dies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to strike him down in his religion, unless he repents from that. أقول خولي هذا واستغفر الله ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله أنت استغفر وتوب إليك and I apologize to the organizers and the audience for going over time. وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. Uh, I have a very healthy number of questions before me this evening. Uh, in the, you know, it seems maybe close to 100 questions. So I'm going to try my best to go through as many of them as I can. Uh, uh, as the brothers in America know, I'm not really well known for my uh, brevity in speech, but uh, I will try to uh, see what I can do to go through these questions. So if the answers are sort of short, uh, it's not because I'm dismissing the, the question or its importance, but just because I want to make people feel that I was able to answer as many questions in the time allotted to me. So my apologies uh, uh, beforehand. Uh, the question says, do you think it is appropriate for the du'at to take social security payments and claim that they are workers uh, in Allah's path, so it is justified that they do not work? Uh, did not the best of the scholars all work for a living also? Uh, like Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, radiallahu anhu, jazakumullah khairan wa ya'akum. Well, uh, you know, the, in general, I mean, a Muslim should not take uh, social security payments from the unbelievers, uh, uh, such as a fatwa which I had heard um, on a tape uh, uh, from uh, Shaykh al-Albani, rahmatullahi alayhi. But one can imagine that during some circumstances uh, that a Muslim might be required to take social security payments because either... Uh, the Muslim community is unable to support this person or unwilling to support this person. Uh, of course, people who are engaged in da'wah uh, should avoid that, uh, if not only just to uh, not have people say such things about them. And Allah knows best. Uh, what do you say about um, those who call our scholars uh, heretics, like uh, Sayyid Qutb, uh, rahmatullahi alayhi? Um, if the person who is calling a certain individual a heretic he could say Qutb or anybody else, who himself is a scholar, then it's, he's justified to do that because a scholar is justified to say that this person is upon the Sunnah or this person is upon Bid'ah, upon heresy. But if the person himself is not a scholar, then from where is he saying such a thing? So obviously he would be speaking out of, not without knowledge, and for that his statement would be um, uh, condemnable and he would have uh, transgressed. Uh, as far as Sayyid Qutb, rahmatullahi alayhi, I mean, he was uh, not a scholar in the, in the traditional sense. Uh, Sayyid Qutb was a man who dedicated his life, and inshallah ta'ala, he died a shaheed for the cause of Islam. But he wasn't a scholar in the traditional sense. He was an educator. He was a man known for uh, his knowledge of the Arabic language and so forth. And then later on in his life, uh, after returning from the United States where he was sent, uh, to, uh, by the Egyptian government and so forth. Uh, he returned back to Islam and he became uh, returned back uh, to uh, the Islam and tried to spend the rest of his life promoting and teaching and learning about Islam. And he was imprisoned, he went through many trials and so forth. But he wasn't a scholar in the traditional sense. I mean, his life was one, a man of the letters and so forth. So as a result, his writings, uh, while it has many beneficial things, as uh, the scholars have said, like Sheikh al-Albani and others, it also has things which are, uh, are questionable and indeed erroneous. But you know, the way of the people of Islam, the way of the people of the Sunnah, is that if a person is known for his overwhelming good, then we try to find an excuse for his faults. Yes, we say these are faults, we should not follow them, but we do not use it as a means to uh, defame and, or attack that person's character. Um, What's the best way for a Muslim that is locked up in jail with no Muslims to be build up his iman and be a strong believer? Uh, can he be a good believer if only surrounded by the kuffar? Yes, he can be a good believer if only surrounded by the kuffar. Obviously, it's a very great struggle. Um, the best way for him to do that is for uh, him to, of course, read the Quran, to be close to Allah. And if we are aware of a Muslim in such a predicament, then for those of us who are on the outside, uh, they need to try to contact him either by visiting him or sending him letters or books or tapes, whatever means is available to keep his spirits high and so that he may feel that the ummah has not abandoned him and to assist him in the, his growth and, and so forth. Uh, how should we answer someone who quotes the ayah of the Jews taking their rabbis as their deities, etc., when you tell them what a scholar has said on a particular issue? Uh, these people imply that by listening to the scholars, you are not taking from them the Quran and Sunnah, even though the scholars are taking the Quran and Sunnah, and that you may be committing shirk. Jazakumullah uh, khair. Well, if the, if, the, if the situation is as the questioner has posed, then obviously these people are ignorant So, by saying such things. So if they're ignorant, what do we do? We have to educate and illuminate uh, the minds and the hearts uh, of those who are ignorant. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned uh, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, 
for taking uh, their scholars and their, and, their, and their worshipers amongst them as lords uh, besides Allah. And the Prophet wasallam explained this to Adi ibn Hatim by uh, saying that they used to do this by them making lawful for them what Allah had forbade for them in the Torah or in the Gospel. Or alternatively making forbidden what had Allah had made lawful for them in the Torah and the Gospel. And so then there when, the, when their people followed them in the changing of Allah's law, then that was a form of worship to them. Okay? So that doesn't mean you don't follow the scholars. Okay? The scholars who, who, who give you a, a ruling uh, rooted in Allah's book, rooted in the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, are to be obeyed. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you know not. Um, As-salamu alaykum, alaykum as uh, If someone asks you about a particular person or group which are classified as Muslims, but have incorrect methods, are you obliged to answer? And if so, is this backbiting? You're not obliged to answer. And indeed, I would think that for most of the Muslims, especially Muslims living in lands like Australia or the United States or Canada or in Europe, um, as Muslim minorities, you know, getting into these issues about the groups and so forth and their errors and their faults and, and the contemporary uh, preachers and movements and so forth really is not a beneficial knowledge. Because see, people in these lands are between, are in a, the majority of the Muslims in, this, in these lands uh, do not have the ability to keep in their faith. Most of the people, unfortunately, I mean, let's be real with ourselves, right, fall out of Islam and fall either truly into unbelief or live a life which is identical to the life of the unbelievers. So to be a Muslim who is deviated is better than to be an unbeliever. To be a deviated Muslim is better than to be an unbeliever. Of course, we want the Muslims to be all Muslims upon the Sunnah. But if the people of the Sunnah are few and spread far apart and are, are bickering and so forth because their intention is not pure to Allah, so Allah is punishing them, then, you know, I mean, we, we shouldn't be so harsh against those who are making people at least keeping them within the fold of Islam and not allowing them to fall into unbelief. Yes, of course, one has to always speak the truth and, and point out faults where they are, but there's a what means and there's a way to do so. Uh, do you believe that there are scholars who are paid by governments to speak by what those governments want? Yeah, this is a very obvious question. Of course there are. Are you paid by any government or organization? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I work for my living and I you know, pay my taxes. So I pay the government. They don't pay me. If I could get that switched around, I would enjoy that. But unfortunately, they take my money for, through taxes. So, uh, Please comment on the brothers that make takfir of the scholars because of the fact that the scholars do not make takfir of the leaders today. In other words, uh, since the scholars does not call the ruler an unbeliever, uh, then the scholars become unbelievers by, um, by uh, necessity. Uh, because there's a big movement in uh, the UK concerning these issues. Well, we're in Australia, so we shouldn't worry about too much about what's going on in the UK. But anyway, uh, let us assume that the, the issues have reached here. Making takfir of the scholars requires the person himself as a scholar. So if you see somebody making takfir, then he's claiming that he's a scholar, okay? Now yes, a person by not recognizing uh, somebody who's an apostate to be an apostate can become an unbeliever. That, that is a principle which has validity in it to it. But just because a scholar does not call a certain government an, unbelie an unbelieving, an apostate government, doesn't necessarily mean that the scholar is an unbeliever. Maybe perhaps the evidence is not clear to him that that, that that government is an apostate government. Maybe he believes it's an apostate government, but believes that wisdom and the, the benefit of the Muslim necessitates his silence. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe uh, he is sinful by not speaking out the truth. I mean, all of these are possibilities. And so since there is more than one possibility, how can one hasten to assume the worst about it? And this indicates a sickness in the heart. Um, brother, I love Allah and his messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, you know, reward you for this. And, and I want to learn about Islam, but Muslim brothers give me a hard time. Uh, they say, don't join a, this group, and another brother would give me a different opinion. What should I do? Uh, don't listen to what the people say. Uh, go to where you think you're going to learn and benefit in your religion. Okay? And if you're confused, then, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us how to, how to discern the truth in matters. He told us to make this type of prayer uh, during the night prayer. Not the, it's outside, of, uh, when you pray in the night time, a voluntary prayer after Salat al-Isha, that you make this dua. Allahumma. O oh Allah, Rabbi Jibra'ila wa Mika'ila wa Israfil, O oh Allah, Lord of Gabriel and Michael and Israfil, which is they say in English, Raphael. Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard, the creator of the heavens and the earth. 
Alimul Ghaybi wa Shahad, the one who knows that which is visible and that which is hidden. Uh, you judge between your servants and what they have differed. Guide me to the truth in which they have differed. And indeed, the Muslim has been commanded in every prayer to recite Surah Al Fatiha, which part of it is Ihdina Surat Mustaqeen, guide me to the straight path. So anybody who is seeking the truth and is sincere in that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him to that truth. And so don't pay attention to these people who try to, you know, push you away. If they come and they, and they really have something which is um, uh, something which is of you know true basis, and they are not backbiting, but they really have some knowledge, and what they're saying has evidence to it. Then you you could take their advice. But uh, most of the time, you find people just talking out of ignorance and out of jealousy and so forth. Uh, assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. My question is: If a sister is backbiting, and we know she is, what's the best way to approach uh, her, and what if she continues to do so? What next? Well, uh, the best thing to do is to give her advice. Uh, and when giving a person advice, one should not do it publicly. Because then you start rebuking the person. You see, the Prophet ﷺ, when somebody would commit a public evil, and it would reach him, the Prophet ﷺ would give a speech, and he would say, why is it that I hear that certain people are doing certain things? He would never stand on his member and say, why is it that so-and-so is doing something, and so-and-so is doing something? Because you're not supposed to rebuke a person. So if you're close to that sister, you can approach her in private. If not, then perhaps the sisters can gather together, they can you know, decide that one of them would give a speech about backbiting, you see what I'm saying? And that sister would be present, so perhaps she would hear, and, you know, and that her heart would change. Also make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, brings her to her senses and so forth. I have read the statements of many great scholars attacking uh, backbiting and other, and other respected scholars. What do you say about these uh, attacking scholars? Oh, I have read statements about scholars attacking by other respected scholars. What do you say about these attacking scholars? Uh, really, brothers, the scholars, uh, there's, no, there's no true reports that the scholars would attack and backbite other scholars. This doesn't exist. Um, so sometimes scholars might criticize other scholars, and this is natural, and this is something which is to be expected, and this is something which is correct at times. Because in anything, uh, all the scholars, you know, from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu any, any human being uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu uh, who is a scholar is prone to be erroneous at times as he is prone to be correct at other times. And so therefore the person, when he makes a mistake, he has to be corrected and that mistake has to be amended so people do not follow that scholar in his error. But that is different than backbiting or, uh, or attacking them. To point out a mistake uh, and always finding an excuse for the person to make a mistake and remembering that that person is you know, typically upon the truth and typically is correct and to recognize and respect him, that is not considered backbiting. Um, what makes a person become a scholar? Memorizing the Quran or a certain amount of hadith, for example? No, no scholarship is not just a memorization of the Quran or hadith in itself. Scholarship is a process by which a person becomes knowledgeable of the religion of Islam and scholarship is degrees. You know, just like now you have in any other field of knowledge, branch of knowledge, in any sort of subject which human beings study, okay? I mean, let's take a subject like chemistry, okay? Um, all of us have, uh, every single person has a, a general amount of, of, of knowledge of chemistry. Uh, people understand that, for instance. People understand that, for instance, that if there's something acidic, you put baking soda in it, for instance, to neutralize it, right? So people, they have an upset stomach, they take, you know, baking soda or something like that to, you know, uh, cool the acid in their stomach. This is something which people understand, some basic chemistry like that. And then you have people who study some formal chemistry. Uh, some people study it only in high school, so they have a very rudimentary understanding of Other people study it in college. Other people get master's degrees. Other people get PhD degrees. And then become people, some people become so knowledgeable of chemistry, they might even win the Nobel Prize for chemistry. So, you know, in that, in a field like chemistry, there's, there's degrees of knowledge. You know, the one who has uh, high school chemistry is more knowledgeable than the one who has no chemistry. The one who has college is more knowledgeable than the one who has high school, and so forth and so on. And there are many degrees in between. So, you know, scholarship is not just reading a book, it's not memorizing the Qur'an, it's not, just, it's not just memorizing hadith, it's a whole group and collection of things that makes a person to be considered to be knowledgeable and an authority in, in this case, in Islamic knowledge. And people this of degrees. So, um, you know, in order to appreciate that, you yourself have to have some sort of recognition of what Islamic knowledge is, you know. Uh, when you have some knowledge, you can then start distinguishing between those who are you know, the advanced scholars as opposed to those who are uh, just, you know, small scholars or just students or, or just people who have general education and so forth. 
Um, can you tell us about the aqid of Hassan al banna and Sayyid Qutb? Because we hear people say different things about them. No, I mean, again, I mean, you know, we want to raise ourselves above, you know, getting into the particulars of different individuals. Hassan al banna uh, rahmatullah alayhi, he was a person who appeared at the beginning of the last century who spent great efforts in reviving Islam. And as Shaykh al-Albani has said, that you know, thousands and thousands of people around the world you know, became guided because of his da'wah efforts. And, and his da'wah efforts launched one of the greatest uh, revivalistic movements in our time, the uh, Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood. And Sayyid Qutb, as I mentioned, also spent you know, a great portion of his life, uh, his later life, to try to learn Islam and teach it and preach it. And it, also, it even resulted in him being executed for his preaching to Islam. And Hassan Benna was shot down dead. So these are men who, you know, who strove and gave their lives for Islam. Uh, uh, you know, so we, and they, they've passed and they've already met their Lord. You know what I'm saying? So for us, it doesn't behoove us you know what I'm saying, to open up these chapters and to try to dig and so forth. This is all indication of sickness, you know, especially for us you know, youth and so forth. Or rather, what we should do is we should be concentrating on the fundamentals of Islam. You know, I, was, I was asking the people here, you know, I mean, how many Muslims do you have here in, uh, in, in Melbourne? They said 100,000 or 200,000. How many people are in this area? Three million people. Okay. There's three million souls out there that da'wahs need to be given to, you know? And we're going to spend now our time in getting to the details of Hassan al-Banna and Sayyid Qutub. I mean, where, 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 is, where is the balance in that? Where is the sense in that? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if now we're supposed to, if I was to pass out the test to most people and ask basic questions about the law, many of us might not even know the basic answers on how to pray. So we need to take things in priority, you know. Yes, there is a place in the religion of Islam to understand those people and those movements and understand their strengths and their weaknesses and where they are correct and wrong. But for the average Muslim, especially a Muslim living in a non-Muslim country, in front of him are many, many great responsibilities that he should pay attention to first before delving into these types of issues. Uh, what makes a person become a scholar? I think I answered this question. Uh, what happens if a scholar backbites another scholar? Uh, scholars do not backbite other scholars. They're above that, as I said. Um, is, con is it considered backbiting or sliding to advise somebody about an individual who has an influence over them when this individual has either a misunderstanding in the dean or is intentionally or not misleading or deceiving those under his influence? What if that individual is, this individual is a scholar or a leader? Again, you see what I'm saying? We, we see a certain trend amongst the youth, you know what I'm saying? of wanting to classify people, wanting to, to, uh, uh, to, to raise judgment, pass judgment on the people. And this is something which most of the Muslims are not at the stage where they, they're able to do this. And so this is going to lead this person into a position which is going to harm him and harm the one who he talks to. Uh, rather than spending efforts, you know what I'm saying, in going into this matter, what, if you have knowledge, if the questioner is having knowledge or he's talking about somebody who, who, who purports to have knowledge, um, and that person should spend time just teaching the good, teaching the what is right. And by clarifying that it was what is right and what is good, then that person who is under the influence of somebody who has a misunderstanding will come to realize that what is correct, you know, what he's being taught is at variance with what is correct, and that will help him to, you know, break uh, that chain and to uh, f leave being under the influence of that person. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. What should our attitude be towards the scholars of Islam uh, who may be correct in some matters of fiqh issues but may be wrong in other matters of aqidah? I mean, again, you see, again, this is, you know, uh, bringing out the same sort of attitude, okay? We're, we're now looking at the scholars and we want to classify them. Well, they're correct in fiqh, in matters of worship or law, but in matters of belief, they're incorrect. So what should we do with these people? Well. I mean, the, the, answer, the answer, the obvious answer is that you take from them that which is correct and that which is their incorrect, you leave. But my question is, is that the one who asked the question or the one who has been faced with a similar question, does he or she have the ability to distinguish what the scholar has said is right or wrong in the first place? And if not, then why ask the question? Then it would make more sense to learn and if you learn, then you can distinguish what is right and wrong. Then rather asking a hypothetical question that even if you had the answer to it, you wouldn't be able to act upon it. I don't think because I'm uh, answering this question is harsh that I, I don't like my brothers and sisters. So. Uh, dear brother, assalamu alaikum. The title of the lecture was Defenders of Faith. Could you please tell me some of the notable scholars of the past and today who have defended the deen in the most difficult times those who fall in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ who said that Allah 
would send one person every uh, century to revive the religion. Well, the hadith says men, and the Arabic word men does not mean necessarily a single individual, but also mean a, a group of individuals. Men you jetted, that you know, the Prophet said that at the turn of every century, Allah will raise up people who will revive this religion. So it doesn't mean just one person's people. And the revival of the religion can be in the whole religion, or can be to certain aspects. It can be across the world, or can just be in certain areas. This is just means that at the beginning of each century, there is a revival of Islam. This is, this is how Allah preserves this religion from century to century, because this is the final religion. There is no prophet or scripture to come. But all that lies before us is the day of judgment. So, uh, I mean, the scholars are many. Um, I, I have a lecture which... Uh, uh, perhaps you, you might have you can hear find the tape which talks about this, but I mean amongst whom was Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, Imam al Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, uh, Shaykh al Albani, Rahmatullah, Shaykh ibn Baz, and I mean so so many. You know, but the problem is when you get into questions like this, is that when you start mentioning some and you don't mention others, people make the assumption that by not mentioning the others, right, that you've excluded them from those who have revived the religion. So everybody wants a list, okay? So I give you the list, and so that means therefore if they're not in the list, okay, then he has them once to revive the religion, let's start talking ill about it. No, that's not true. The people who've revived, who have revived this religion are too many, too numerous for any human being to be able to count them all. And if you read the books of history, if you read the biographies of the scholars, and you go through page by page by page of the century, I mean, you find there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of scholars who have revived this religion. And each of them will have their reward and their uh, share of the hereafter uh, to the degree of their knowledge and their striving for, for Islam. Uh, should scholars work for oppressive governments? Do not the Prophet ﷺ and the Salaf abhor this? Yes, they, they, they would abhor working for oppressive governments when they would, in the sense that you're uh, assisting the oppressor in his oppression. But do you not find that in the Quran, Yusuf alayhi salam, a prophet of Allah, asking Pharaoh to put him in charge of the, of, of the grains of Egypt so that it may be distributed correctly during the famine. Uh, there is a trend nowadays to classify scholars as such as saying, so-and-so is a government scholar, and so-and-so is from the Muslim Brotherhood, and so-and-so is from the Murjia. Could you say a few words about this a fitna of dividing people and its origins and where it leads? Well, I think the whole lecture was talking about backbiting and so forth, and so that's, that's sufficient uh, for that. Um, question. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions as to who is a scholar nowadays and uh, for a five or f for that a four or five year degree equals scholarship. Uh, could you mention some of the criteria for scholarship such as ijaza, in other words having a certificate. Uh, also there are some people who claim scholarship yet they have not memorized the Quran. Could you also discuss the path to scholarship and whether a scholarship, uh, uh, whether learning the Quran is a prerequisite to scholarship? Well learning the Quran obviously is a prerequisite to scholarship. Uh, that's, I mean, that should be a given, right? I mean, how can you be a scholar and you don't know the Qur'an, Allah's book? But, I mean, the point is, is that scholarship is something which is not a thing which is that you can count. You can say, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're a scholar. You know, just like now, if you just go to college and you graduate and you receive a paper, doesn't mean that you are now qualified in what you have received that paper in. So it's not just the matter of uh, just doing this or that that makes you a scholar. Scholarship is a process by which a person becomes, masters that field, whatever that field happens to be, whether it's Islamic knowledge, whether it's a, a form of secular knowledge, whether it's medicine, science, I mean, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and so therefore, uh, having a certificate or graduating are things that can indicate to scholarship or things that can indicate to learning, but in itself is not sufficient. So how does one know a scholar? Well, how does one now know that this doctor that you go to is a qualified doctor as opposed to a quack. How do you know the difference between the two? There are signs and indications, you know, that for instance all the other doctors around have, have accepted him in practicing medicine. You know, he's graduated from a reputable school. Uh, he's not known to have any malpractice suits against him. Uh, he has, uh, you know, his patients uh, go to him and they come out, you know, in a better state and so forth. These are all signs that can indicate that the person is qualified in the practice of medicine. One in itself is not sufficient, but in its totality, then you can say, well, this person now 
is, you know, a, a, a doctor. He's an okay doctor. He's, you know, the top in his field and so forth. I mean, like the, the hospital that he works in. So the same way, like the message the person teaches from. And these are all different signs that can be done. When, when a person starts to learn about Islamic knowledge and starts to understand what is Islamic knowledge, then he can begin, or she can begin with that, to start appreciating who is a scholar and who is not a scholar. Uh, why is it that brothers are willing uh, to spend on their Muslim brothers but not on their wives? Uh, why is it that we watch TV but if the Prophet was with us we wouldn't and we know that Allah is watching us? Uh, why is it that Muslims who are supposed to be trustworthy are never on time? Uh, why is it that Muslims um, do just disgusting things in front of other people such blowing as their nose? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean these are, I mean, are all uh, indications of, of ill behavior. And ill behavior uh, comes from a human being uh, due to the lack of their piety or their common sense. So when you find Muslims who are ill in their behavior, uh, like uh, spending on their brothers, but not spending on their wives, uh, watching TV, um, not uh, you know, keeping their agreements and so forth, it shows either a lack of religion or a lack of good character. So the cure is uh, to be pious and the cure is uh, to uh, amend oneself. And, and, and like we said in, in the lecture, right? That a person should worry about his own sins before he starts worrying about the other sins. So when you see sins in the people, then you should reflect, well, I see this bad character, I see this wrong in this person, now I should have some introspection and make sure I don't have it in myself. But not, you know, find that fault in the person, and then in yourself you have even maybe even a greater fault. That's obviously uh, 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 to be condemned. Uh, can you please explain how that we would approach our parents these days trying to explain some certain things to them? Uh, most parents these days said, I have heard such and such scholar give a fatwa on these television shows. Um, what is your, your opinion on these television shows like the art uh, station? Well, I've never uh, watched the art station, so I, I can't say about uh, what type of uh, discussions are, are done on them. Um, I mean, anyway, when giving doubt to one's parents, right, I mean, if your parents are following, uh, they hear a fatwa, whether they get it by television or radio or newspaper, or they ask the sheikh uh, in the masjid, I mean, whatever means by which your parents or anybody else comes to that knowledge. If you happen to have more, better knowledge, or you understand the situation better, then how do you approach a person? How do you give that person da'wah? Well, first of all, you have to be gentle. Uh, second of all, you have to try to understand what has led them to follow that. And then you have to try to convince them that with what you have is better, it's, it's more correct. And uh, especially with the parents, you have the other obligation is that you have to, at the same time, in doing that is to make sure that you honor them and you observe their rights. Um, I, am, I am confused about a scholar who gave ruling that first house bank loan can be okay in a non-Muslim country. Uh, have I have any rights to talk against about this ruling and about uh, his validity or about his validity to accept well, I don't understand the last sentence of the question, but, um, and I don't know exactly what uh, a first house bank loan, but I'm assuming, and this is just an assumption on my part, uh, that a first house bank loan is a loan that's dealing with usury. Is that, um, am I, I'm assuming this is what this meant by this. So, um, I mean, usury is, is forbidden in the Quran, it's forbidden in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu There are very severe punishments uh, to engage in usury in the hereafter that have been mentioned. Um, and uh, some scholars, contemporary scholars, have tried to find allowances for certain forms of usury. Uh, one of the arguments that is made by them is that uh, Muslims living in non-Muslim countries are under duress, and so since they're under duress, they have an exception uh, to uh, engage in certain forms of usury. Another argument they make is that usury, the rules forbidding usury, are only in effect in the lands of Muslims, but in the lands of the unbelievers, uh, these rules are in suspension. Now, now, uh, these arguments, uh, when, when they are studied uh, in light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, are generally weak arguments, are generally weak arguments. And that is why the majority of the scholars do not find this license uh, to um, purchase homes or other or matters uh, through usury, uh, irrespective of if you're in a Muslim or in a non-Muslim country. Um, do you have the right to talk against this ruling? Yes, you do have the right to talk against this ruling if you have knowledge. If you have knowledge, and you're grounded and so therefore you find fault in this ruling uh, because your knowledge you're able to weigh the arguments or you're, because you have knowledge you're able to yourself form your own opinion which is obviously the highest form of knowledge and you can add your opinions to the body of wealth of uh, 
of, of opinions, or alternatively, uh, you, you maybe you don't have the ability to add your own opinion, but you have the knowledge in order to discern between the various opinions, then you have the rights to talk about this, either in pro or in anti, concerning this or any other uh, question or ruling. Uh, uh, so this is, this is permitted. But the problem comes, the problem comes when people uh, do not have knowledge, and the reason why uh, they follow this opinion or that opinion is because uh, they like this person. This person maybe is from their country, you know what I'm saying? Or this person, they just uh, have feel an affinity to him. Or uh, uh, this person gives a ruling which happens to agree with the, what their personal inclination is, uh, what their personal likes are, and so therefore they follow that. So this is all blameworthy. But rather, one should, when he's given opinion, or more than one opinion, he should try to find that opinion which his heart feels is the closest to the judgment of Allah and his messenger. And if he has, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if he has the ability uh, to, to preach, then that's fine. But if not, he should, he should abide by that in himself and he should remain silent. Because by him adding his voice, it only increases in the confusion. And that's the problem now. You see, for instance, you would not find, you know, uh, among people, if, if you had a person now who went, uh, he was ill, and he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, look, you know, I think you have um, this type of illness, and so therefore you need surgery. Or I think that you have this type of illness, and so therefore uh, you need to take this type of medication. Well, yeah, the doctor could have made a wrong diagnosis. He could make a wrong diagnosis. But generally, if the person came out of that and started to then make himself a medical authority, and say, well, no, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And really, I, I read this article in Time magazine, or I heard this program on the television, or I heard, I asked this other doctor, and he said such and such. And now he raises himself to the point. People say, okay, well, if you're so knowledgeable about medicine, you know what I'm saying? Then, you know, doctor, heal thyself. Because people understand that, you know, they don't have the ability to deal into this. But unfortunately, because of the lack of piety, the lack of fear of Allah, everybody feels that he can give his two cents regarding matters of religion. And so therefore what we have is we have all these voices, just this great morass of confusion, and people are at loss. And so it leads to dispute, it leads to argumentation, it leads to confusion. If people said, well, all I know of Allah's religion is these basic things, and they stuck to it, and they tried to worship Allah and fear Allah with it, at least it would, it would be silent out there. Then we have two or three voices and let the scholars themselves, you know, deal it with it. Uh, how do I encourage a girl of 17 years old that Islam is the way when her mother, a revert that has embraced Christianity again, so I guess the, the person saying that she was what, she became a Muslim and then she went back to Christianity, uh, has recently baptized her. Her Muslim father has asked me for help. The girl drinks, does drugs, and is sleeping with her boyfriend and has embraced Christianity. Well. You know, the problem is, the problem doesn't start when the girl is 17 years old. The problem starts before the father marries the mother. That's where the problem starts, see. People are not pious and are not concerned about how they're going to raise their families. They get into illicit sexual relations and sometimes pregnancies happen, they're forced to get married, or alternatively, um, they don't care and, they, and they, they marry heedlessly, not trying to see and find a person who is pious, who's going to assist them in the religion. And then all these problems occur and then when the child is 17, you know, or 18 or whatever, they try to find a quick fix. Well, there's no quick fix for this because the problem started even before she was born. So therefore, I mean, the cure for this is not to get into these types of situations. Now, um, if the girl drinks and does drugs and is sleeping with her boyfriend, I mean, this is to be expected. She's not a Muslim anymore, right? I mean, that's what the questioner is saying. And so therefore, uh, what should be done is um, somebody should try to give her dawah to Islam. Try to convince her that she was created for a noble purpose. And that noble purpose that she was created for is to worship her Lord. And that her Lord Allah has these names and attributes and is perfect and is forgiving but also severe in punishment and that her Lord has legislated a way of life called Islam and has sent to her a prophet, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's upon her to try to believe in that prophet, to believe in that prophet and follow him and to live her life according to that religion which her Lord has sent down to the people of the earth for them to worship him by and to live their lives by and conduct themselves by. And that after life there is a judgment 
And depending on how one conducts his life, he will either be successful or will be uh, condemned to the hellfire. When you give that message to any human being, whether it's this girl or anybody else, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide her and to guide us and all uh, who we can reach, uh, then the human being is now, has been made aware of their responsibilities and you know, guidance now is now something in, in Allah's hands. We have done our charge. We've discharged the message. We've explained it to the people. And so, um, you know, this is a very sad uh, story, and there's so many like this. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be gentle with us and to forgive us our sins and guide us to that which is right. Is there, is there a message for me? That's not, I thought they were saying time is up. Okay. Um, assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. I have got a friend who does not wear hijab. However, she wants to. Can you please explain the importance of hijab and the punishment for not wearing it? Well, you know, if your friend wants to wear the hijab, that means she's close to the truth. So you just need to prompt her. And, and suffice it for her is that, you know, you, you just tell her that this is Allah's command. And by disobeying Allah, she is putting herself in the threat of Allah's punishment. You don't know when you might die. You know, any moment you could be in a car accident, you could hit by a car, you know, something could happen to you, you could pass away. Or even if you don't die, you know, by being disobedient to Allah Azawajal, you could be continuous to be disobedient until your heart is sealed due to your disobedience. And so therefore, uh, a person needs to repent and to hasten uh, their repentance before their heart becomes sealed or because uh, death overtakes them and so forth. So, um, so, I mean, for the sister, I mean, she should, you know, you should make dua for her, make dua to Allah, so which Allah guides her. And she should ask Allah, so she should pray to Allah that Allah gives her the strength to overcome or her fears for wearing the hijab or her embarrassment because she's afraid how the unbelievers or her family will look at her or her shyness or whatever and, and to be firm on the truth and inshallah ta'ala uh, she will be quick to do that. Uh, what are the punishment of the people who backbite? I mean as we mentioned I mean that a person who um, who uh, the Prophet said a person might say a word to which he does not you know think of it big and it might cause him to fall in the hellfire for 70 years. That's just one of the punishments of, of, of speaking ill. And there are many in the hadith. Uh, what are the rights of, of women over her husband? There are many rights that she has. In fact, rights that husband and women have are mutual, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. But men have one degree over women, and that is because men are responsible for, the, um, for being in charge and for uh, providing. Uh, so they have a degree, which is that, that they have a degree of obedience and respect an honor that is supposed to be accorded to them as a result. But each of them have mutual rights of the other. I mean, part of the rights that the woman has over her husband, that her husband uh, provides for her, that her husband takes care of her, her husband uh, provides for her emotionally, psychologically, physically, through love, through respect, you know, attends to her, takes care of her, shows her her tenderness, his, show, show her his tenderness, his love, uh, helps her grow in her religion, you know, supports her. Oh, I mean, all these are so many rights. I mean, it's, it's impossible to... To, to sum them all. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has, has you know, summarized it, all these rights which would take volumes and volumes for us to say in a single ayah. That, that they have what men have in mutual rights and good and men have a single degree. Just one degree over, over, over their spouses. Uh, if your parents want you to get married to someone who you hate uh, but you love someone else, would it be uh, a bad thing, a uh, haram? Uh, it depends here. Um, if, if the person that you hate, uh, you hate him for a, a reason which allows you in the sharia to hate, to, to, to dislike. I mean, you should, a Muslim should never hate another person, another Muslim, and that's first and foremost. So maybe the word used in the question is a bit too strong. But let's say you dislike. Uh, if, you, if you dislike him due to the person not being religious, being impious, that is permissible. If you dislike the person because you don't find a physical attraction to the person, that is also permissible. Uh, should you then... Uh, you want to love someone else and you want to marry someone else. Well, here's why do you love that person? If your parents want you to marry somebody, encourage you to marry somebody who is religious, who is pious, who, who is a person who looks like he's mature, judicious, can take care of you, can uh, you know, uh, support you, uh, help you grow in your religion. You want to marry somebody who is impious, who doesn't do their prayers, who is negligent, but ha perhaps maybe is more handsome than the other person. And this is something which is hot on, obviously. So, you know, the question is that love and hate should always be anchored in what Allah loves and what Allah hates. And should not be anchored uh, in what our souls desire. Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that perhaps you love something, 
which is bad for you, and perhaps you hate something which is good for you. Uh, uh, when making dhikr, example, saying subhanallah, uh, do we uh, verbalize it? Yes. Uh, do you get punished for things you think about? Example, thinking about how much you hate a person. Uh, again, as I said, you know, I mean, hate is a very severe word. You should only hate a person because Allah hates that person or the Prophet ﷺ hates that person. But otherwise, you dislike or something like that. But not to hate is something very severe. Uh, as far as the things, uh, thinking about uh, things, uh, you can get punished about thinking about things if you mean by thinking about them, you want to carry them out. But because for some reason or not, you can't carry them out, okay? So you plot, you know what I'm saying, in your mind on how to murder somebody, right? And you think of it very well and so forth, you know? But when it comes time to actually, you know, uh, uh, to actually do it, uh, there happens to be a police officer in the area, so I'm going to have to, you know, not do it. Yeah, you get a sitter for doing that. Because if the police officer wasn't there, you would have shot that person, you know? You're hiding behind the bushes or whatever. So, um, but if you think about something, if a thought passes to you, and then you realize that this is something forbidden, and so then you, you, know, you discard it, you dispense from it, then you will not be uh, held responsible for it. And the proof is uh, the, the, the verses, in the concluding verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, which um, uh, uh, abrogated uh, the third verse before the conclusion of, of Surah Al-Baqarah, as the Hadith in Sahih Muslim says. Uh, what do you say to that brother that don't take any fatawa of Shaykh Ibn Baz because of the fact that he was blind? Well... Um, I say to them, okay, is blindness, according to the Sharia, a proof for not accepting a fatwa of somebody? Because that's the that's that's the that's the um, that's the premise here. That if someone is blind, he cannot deliver a fatwa. So where where did we get this premise? Obviously, uh, that there is no evidence to that. And in fact, some of the Prophet's companions, like Ibn Abbas, radiAllahu anhu. Who the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allahumma faqihu fi deen. Oh Allah, give him deep understanding in the religion. Wa'alimhu ta'wil and give him the ability to understand the meanings of the Quran. Towards the end of his life, he became blind. Nobody ever said that when Ibn Abbas became blind. Okay, Ibn Abbas, stop teaching the tafsir of the Quran around the Kaaba and pick up your bags and go. No. So, um, uh, blindness does not negate a person from giving a fatwa. Uh, blindness can negate a judge from giving judgment in some matters because uh, in order to be a judge in certain matters it requires the judge to be able to see something. I mean for instance if I'm a judge and you come to me and you say this product is defective okay and in order for me to realize if the product is defective or not I have to be able to see it. In other words its defectiveness cannot be determined to me uh, by its sound or by its taste or by its touch or something like that but only by sight. In this case, a blind judge would not be able to give uh, that judgment if the product was defective or not because of his blindness. But uh, in terms of giving a fatwa, a religious, a religious ruling, a religious ruling does not require a sight uh, in order to give that. Uh, can you please uh, recommend readings that refute the devious attempts by the Orientalists to attack the first and second and third generation of scholars who claim that they fabricated the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, could you please comment on this issue because it has become quite a major concern. Well, uh, this is a very old argument made by the Orientalists that these chains of narrations were all fabricated and the person who came out with this idea, this theory was, a, was an Orientalist by the name of Joseph Schacht and he has a whole following of people like James Robson and, and others in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere. So uh, the, the one who has really dispelled um, uh, the theories of Schacht in the English language and you can find his books is Muhammad Mustafa al-Azami, a scholar from India. Uh, who has a book uh, called On the Origins of, 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 um, of, of Sheikh's uh, book of the theory of, of, of the origins of hadith. And also he has a book called Early Hadith Literature where he talks about it in great detail. And I think anybody who reads this will have you know, sufficient uh, arguments to rebut these suspicions cast by the Orientalists. And anyway, the funny thing about the Orientalists, you know, just to bring up the point, is that you know, at, on, the, on the one hand they make ho wholesale denial of the, of the chains of narrations of the hadith. Okay? And then on the other hand, if you read their writings, they will selectively take certain hadith or certain historical incidences to prove their arguments regarding something, you know, which they're trying to accuse Islam for. So then what's the balance? I mean, what are you taking? What are you rejecting? You see what I'm saying? 
So obviously, uh, it, it, if you read their writings, you can, you can easily tell that they have no standard of scholarship. It's just basically what their whims uh, uh, dictate to them uh, according to their nefarious plans. Um, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, dear brother, you mentioned uh, last night the hadith about the 73 ummah, the, I mean the ummah dividing into 73 groups, I guess the questioner means. Well, one goes to paradise and 72 go to hell. Uh, do they go to hell for eternity or would they just get punished for their sins? Uh, can you explain? Um, no, the, the fact, they, they do not go to hell for eternity because they are Muslims. And it doesn't mean that if they're a member of one of these deviated sects that they'll definitely go to hell. It means they're under the threat of Allah's punishment. And when you're under the threat of Allah's punishment and you do not repent for that sin, what the threat of the punishment you're from, or you do not have so many good deeds that wipe out that sin, or for instance, you do not suffer some calamity in this world which wipes out the sin, or the intercession of the Prophet or the angels or the other prophets of the righteous does not avail you, then what happens is you become before Allah and you still have the sin hanging on your neck. And so here Allah might forgive you, or Allah might punish you. As the ayat in Surah al uh, uh, as the ayat in Surah Al-Nisa um, state, in Allah la yaghfir an yushraka bihi wa yaghfir ma duna dhalak ni ma Allah does not forgive the sin, meaning at the time of death, if someone dies with the sin of worshipping others with Allah, but he forgives any other sin to whom he pleases, not to anybody to whom he pleases. This is regarding the unrepentant, the person who has not repented from those sins. Uh, there's a question here about food, I didn't quite understand it. Uh, what are the conditions of being a scholar? I think we have... Um, uh, have uh, talked about that. Uh, how do we know who is a good scholar is? Well, how do you know who a good doctor is? I mean, you have to have some knowledge of medicine. You have to use, you know, the different uh, evidences around that to determine if this is a good doctor. How do you know this is a good mechanic? I mean, now when you want to take your car, it breaks down, you want to take it to a repairman. How do you know this is a good mechanic? I mean, there's different evidences which you use to, to try to discern if this is a good mechanic as opposed to a person who doesn't know anything about, you know, fixing cars. The same thing with scholarship. There are, there are ways you can discern that. And the more knowledge you have, the better your discernment is. The better you know about cars, how car engines work, the better you can tell if the mechanic you take your car to get repaired knows what he's doing or doesn't know what he's doing. So it's, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Okay, so I think I, I've answered this uh, before. Knowledge could be of anything. What kind of knowledge are you talking? Well, we're talking about religious knowledge. A knowledge, you know, I mean, uh, the lecture, I, I had to skip off many things because of the time constraints, but, you know, knowledge is... Uh, different types. I mean, the, the best knowledge is religious knowledge, knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah. And then worldly knowledge is different degrees. Knowledge of medicine is considered to be the best of worldly knowledge because it brings, it brings life to people. It, it, and in the same way, like the religion brings life to the soul and causes people to be successful in the hereafter, so medicine brings life to the body and causes success in this world. And then afterwards, the knowledge have degrees, and there's even some knowledge which is considered to be harmful knowledge, uh, considered to be uh, evil knowledge which will, which will harm you, like uh, knowledge of, um, uh, knowledge of, uh, of uh, you know, um, uh, unbelief, which a person then believes in it and, and acts upon this unbelief and so forth. Uh, the questioner says, if you're talking about religious knowledge, then why has Allah mentioned scientific facts of the universe in the Quran? Well, Allah mentioned these scientific facts in order to show as a way to prove to people that this Quran is a book of Allah, Azawajal. Um, but it doesn't mean that the true knowledge is scientific knowledge. I mean, because knowledge of science doesn't make a person righteous, right? I mean, a person can know any science. A person can be a biologist, a person can be a chemist, a person can be a physicist, a person can be an economist, a person can be, you know, have knowledge of geography, knowledge of language, knowledge of computers. Does that make a person now uh, go to paradise because of that knowledge? No. That's knowledge of some worldly matter. But knowledge of Allah, knowledge of the last day, and knowledge of the religion of Islam, and knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that knowledge can lead a person to paradise. Now that's not to discredit the other forms of knowledge. The other forms of knowledge are useful, but they're not of the same degree as religious knowledge. I mean, I myself, am, I'm working on my PhD in, uh, in, in, in a field, uh, you know, genetics, uh, bioinformatics. But at the same time, I recognize that you know, knowledge of genes of a human being and, and how they work and the proteins they produce and, and so forth is not like knowledge of the creator. There's a big difference. The difference is like the difference between the creator and his creatures. So yes, there is value in that knowledge, but that knowledge itself doesn't mean a person goes to paradise. But knowledge of the hereafter and of Allah and his messenger in Islam, if a person acts upon that knowledge, can lead him to paradise. 
while the worldly knowledge ends when a person dies. On the day of judgment, the bridge will, that everyone will cross uh, will, as like you said like last night, thinner than a strand of hair and sharper than a uh, or, uh, edge of a sword. For, um, um, or is that for everyone or the bridge will be wide and easy to walk for the believers? Won't the believers at the time of walking over the bridge be as short as a blink of an eye? How long it will be for the disbelievers? No, the disbelievers don't cross the bridge. It's only the believers who try to cross the bridge. And people will cross the bridge according to the degree of their good deeds. So some will cross the bridge um, as fast as a blinking of an eye, some as a flash of lightning, others as a strong wind. A, another group of people will go as a racehorse, some will go as the speed of a camel, which is less than a horse. Some people will run across the bridge, some people will walk, others will crawl, and others will fall off the bridge into hell. It all depends on a person's how much good deeds he has and how many sins he has. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to cross the bridge unscathed. Uh, what is the position of the scholars of Islam that have ruled music and riba as halal? I have across some scholars that, some, that sometimes encourage bid'ah. Please clarify. Well, a scholar can err. And if a scholar errs, it doesn't necessarily mean that he is having ill intent. Because the Prophet ﷺ has said that when the judge exercises his opinion, he, he, he issues an ijtihad, he has is between one and two rewards. If he's correct, he has two rewards, and if he's incorrect, he has one reward. So a scholar can give a fatwa, a religious ruling on some contemporary issue, and be completely off the mark, and not be sinful. He might even be rewarded for that. If he tried to use his utmost ability to find the truth, and he erred, even if that, if that erring release, uh, results in him uh, make, calling something which is haram halal. However, though, if the scholar, in issuing his verdict on some contemporary issue, winds up issuing a verdict based upon his desires or uh, because he, uh, the government which he, uh, this, the land he lives in has a certain agenda which he wants to support, then this person is going to be condemned. And he is like uh, the Prophet said, the judges are three types of judges, one in paradise and two in hell. The one in paradise is the one who knows the truth and then gives judgment to the truth. The two in hell are the one who knows the truth but does not give judgment to the truth, or the one who is ignorant and gives judgment. So when a scholar who is ignorant and, and uh, you know, attempts to, you know, he's a pseudo-scholar, and, and attempts to talk without knowledge, he will go to hell. He's under the threat of Allah's punishment. And likewise, if he's following his desires and giving his judgments, this person will go to hell. But if he is sincere and he strives his utmost and he errs, then he is between one and two rewards. But of course his error must be um, uh, announced to the people and it must be corrected so people do not follow him in his mistake. Uh, could you please tell us of some of the Salaf and their lives and how they revived the religion? Example, Ibn Taymiyyah and Imam Ahmed. Well, this is, I think, another lecture, so perhaps inshallah ta'ala another visit to Australia. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many Muslims use the notion of cho chance in arguing that this universe is created by Allah. Could you please tell us if there is some concept of chance in Islam and can Muslims build their argument using this notion? Well, I'm making an assumption here that the questioner means by chance that the complexity of the universe is so great that statistically it is impossible for random events to have occurred to cause the universe to come about. I mean, I think this is what I understand from the question. So if the person is using this argument, this is a argument that can be used. But the notion of the universe being created and the notion that a person has a creator is something which is, is in the fitrah, the natural, the natural being of a human being, the natural state of a human being. And that's why, as we find in Surah Ibrahim, the prophets said to the people, Afillahi shak, could there any be doubt concerning Allah's existence? So typically people, human beings, recognize the existence of a creator. And those who try to deny that, the most famous example was given to us in the Quran is Fir'aun, Pharaoh. Uh, in their denial of that, they only did it out of arrogance, only out of pride, only trying to deny the truth. But in themselves, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, they recognized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I mean, Pharaoh recognized that Allah existed and Moses was truly the messenger of Allah. And these signs that he was seeing was not sorcery, but actually miracles uh, to show and to uh, signs to prove the prophet of the prophet Musa alayhi salam. So, 
to use arguments like the argument of statistical randomness and so forth, and that how chance this is not possible, I mean, can be used, but in general, the arguments um, uh, that prove Allah's existence are, are already rooted in the human being. And that's why the prophets, when they came to their, their people, they didn't argue with them about Allah's existence because their peoples already recognized them. But rather, they taught them who truly Allah was. They, 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 they cleared away misconceptions people had about their Lord and then informed them why their Lord created them, which is to worship them, uh, and, uh, which is to worship Allah, excuse me, alone, as um, I, uh, we talked about in the first lecture uh, a couple nights ago. Uh, is it okay to have a friend that doesn't have the same religion? No, if you mean friendship in the literal word of the friendship, the word friendship, no. But it is permissible, indeed. Uh, it is encouraged to do good to people. So if somebody, you have an acquaintance who has done good to you, you should reciprocate that good with the same amount of good, whether he's a Muslim or not a Muslim. And likewise, it's good to show goodness to all people, that perhaps in showing them goodness, uh, you might make their hearts soft to accept Allah's religion. But as far as taking friendship, uh, befriending somebody, this is, this is something serious because the Prophet ﷺ has said uh, every individual is upon the friend, uh, upon the religion of his friend, so let every individual look to who he has befriended. And indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the conclusion of Surah Zukhraf, Al-Akhilla, the friends on that day, meaning the day of judgment, are enemies to each other, except for illa al muttaqin except for those people who have taqwa, who base their friendship in Allah Azza wa Jal, they on the Day of Judgment will, their friendship will remain and still remain the Day of Judgment, but those who befriended each other for other reasons in this world, uh, they will become enemies uh, of each other on the Day of Judgment. And if he was truly your friend, how could you have a person a friend and not try to bring him Islam, and convince him to become Islam? And if you're truly concerned about this human being, and you as a Muslim know that if a person doesn't enter into Islam, uh, he, his fate is uh, condemnation to hellfire, how could you... Uh, you know, I mean, you know, have somebody friend and not try to bring that person Islam to, to Islam to them. And then if the person, after bringing Islam to him, then says to you that he doesn't believe in Allah and he rejects Allah and he rejects Islam and he rejects the Quran and rejects the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then how and then how would you still remain, you know, close and attached to somebody who who denies uh, your Lord and denies uh, your Prophet? That that's something obviously which, I mean, really cannot exist in a person's heart. Uh, why did Allah send down prophets before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, why didn't he just send down the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and no one else? Well, first of all, uh, in general, um, uh, we are, uh, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala tells us in the Quran, we do, they do not question him regarding his actions. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will question them regarding their actions. So in general, we don't say why to Allah Azza wa Jalla. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he questions us about what we did. We don't question him about what he has done. And likewise, we know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. He neither commands or decrees something except it has for a perfect wisdom. So Allah decreed that humanity would live through many generations and that part of humanity would believe and part of humanity would disbelieve. And Allah decreed that, you know, that humanity would live all these you know, thousands of thousands of years and different prophets would be sent to them. This is a wisdom uh, for, from, for Allah. And, and there are many reasons why you might speculate to that, but suffice it that we know that our Lord is Al-Hakim. And whatever he creates or decrees for great wisdom, and so we accept that. I mean, why? You know, it's like now if somebody asks me, you know, why didn't Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala create you with, you know, one big eye in the middle of your head? Why too? How am I supposed to know? I mean, but there's a wisdom in that. You know, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us live on the planet Earth and not live us on, on, on the planet Mars or on Jupiter or on Venus? Allah knows why, but there is a wisdom behind that. So, you know, we're not here to question our Lord, we're to submit. I mean, we're His creatures, you know. Uh, we just submit and we obey Allah. So this is, I think, I've been told that the time has run out. I'll make this the um, uh, final question. Um, and I apologize for the unanswered questions, inshallah ta'ala, if we have time to take them tomorrow. Otherwise, uh, my apologies. Uh, is there any proof from the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ used to clean his teeth with his miswak in front of others? Or would he do this in his own privacy with the idea that this is an action to be kept private? Uh, what impression do you think it will give non-Muslims when they see a Muslim walking down the street and brushing his teeth with his miswak? Uh, do they, they think that this guy woke up late? Well, no. Uh, I mean, first of all, the Prophet said, yes, there is evidence the Prophet said, you know, brushed his teeth in public in front of people, you know, as he did it in private. Um, what impression did the non-Muslims, you know, would see when a Muslim is walking down the street brushing his teeth? Why, why should one be concerned with what the people 
you know, think of you if you know that in what you're doing is in accordance with the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, I, I think that the person who asks the question, right, or a person who finds, I mean, maybe the person who asks the question does not f uh, feel hesitation in this. Maybe he heard somebody who does feel some sort of difficulty with this, right? Uh, you, you find people in restaurants, right, using toothpicks in public, right? And yet, you know, I mean, these Muslims who feel ashamed if somebody uses the miswak in public, right? Uh, maybe themselves, you know, pick their tooth in, in, uh, in the restaurant with the toothpick and uh, don't think that's a big deal. So, so in general, uh, one, uh, you know, should not uh, be overtly concerned about how other people should think. One should be concerned if what he's doing is correct or not. Yes, uh, one should take into consideration not to do something which might turn uh, somebody away because if you're trying to bring them the message of Islam, uh, you don't want to do something which they might find peculiar, which will make them focus on that peculiarity and so therefore uh, miss the message of Islam. So if, if somebody says, okay, I'm not going to do it in public because I'm living in a non-Muslim land and these non-Muslims might not understand it, so therefore I don't want them to uh, therefore think of you know, Muslims having this type of peculiarity and so therefore um, I'm not going to do this in, in public. Uh, I mean, there might be some justification to that. But at the same time, one cannot, you know, condemn those who are following the sunnah of the Prophet you know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the fault is with the unbelievers for disbelieving. It's not f the fault with the Muslim for following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Anyway, uh, jazakumullahu khairan uh, for your questions and your comments. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Shadu la ilaha anta sakhfuru wa tubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.